on Saturday evening, on 7.30 in the evening on Saturday, there will be in this room a seasonal song fest. We'll have a piano player and a guitar player, maybe two guitar players, and uh, it'll just be nothing but singing, if you like to do that. So. All right. What? Yeah, I got this one started, yeah. Now, the last time where we left off, we were in the cycle of rebirth, and we were just beginning a discussion of what is called first heaven. And we were discussing why some divinities in some locations in the spiritual world have several or even many different names. And I'd like to continue on with that discussion uh, for this evening. Now, things happen differently in different worlds. And sometimes, even in any one of the worlds, there are great differences. Even in the chemical subdivision of the physical world, we have something as rare as hydrogen and something as dense as lead. And it's like that in other worlds also. In the desire world, something like vengeance can last for a long time, several lifetimes, thousands of years, while a little whim might last only a few seconds. The same way in the world of thought, some thoughts are instantaneous, while others require centuries to develop. And because some thoughts develop so slowly, philosophers can argue with each other or with other philosophers over the term of centuries. And it's even like that in literature. Gertrude Stein wrote, a rose is a rose is a rose. And she was considered a great uh, literary figure, and she's known for having mastered the semicolon like no one else. <laughs> but she was a very hard factual materialist. Her view of the world and the matter of which it was made is what you see is what you get, nothing else. No nonsense, no romance, and no mystical frills. So her choice of words in a rose is a rose is a rose was probably quite deliberated and quite intentional. But at the same time, it was an argument with Shakespeare because several centuries earlier, Shakespeare says, would a rose by any other name smell as sweet? And he even asked questions like, what's in a name? And thinking of words and names in this manner goes all the way back to Pythagoras. And Pythagoras something, said something to the effect of, if you know someone's name, you have power over them. Now, Pythagoras was an Orphic mystic. And the Orphic's outlook on life was a blend of philosophy and mathematics, uh, poetic mythology, and things like that. For the Pythagoreans uh, and other Orphic's, words were more than just vehicles of language. There was a musical tone power in speaking words of power, such as you hear in chants or incantations. Now, this sort of thing is true to this day in almost all schools of the mysteries. However, when you are incanting something or if you are using words of power, 
It's not speech the way we know it. It's not words like the words I'm using. It may be the same words, only they are intonated and they are impregnated with an inner power. I've heard people from various schools try to use this, and I don't think they knew what they were doing because I've never felt comfortable with any of it. It seemed to me that it was uh, amateurish, and probably they didn't have the soul power or know how to put the soul power into it. Now, Madame Blavatsky intimates that as one passes through the different initiations, one learns the name of God, one syllable at each initiation. Possession of that word and the ability to speak it made one a divinity, a God with a small g able to change the uh, outer world around us. And when people talk about the name of God, it is that each of our own names, our own true names, is a variation on the name of God. And it's quite common in a few mystical societies, East and West, that when people are taken into a group, they're given a new name. And that new name represents a birth into a spiritual outlook that is new and different. <laughs> now, sometimes those kinds of names are meant to be secret, but people bandy them about as though it were some kind of status symbol and that's why I find that a little bit humorous. There, there is power and there is weakness in a name. Just like Pythagoras says, if people know, if someone knows your name, they have a power. Meaning to say that your true name should always be kept secret. And um, that Knowing a name gives one a power and also gives one a weakness. We have this in folklore. We have the story of Rumpelstiltskin, that if you knew his name, you, you were in control of him. And all of the weaving of straw into gold, he had to do at your command. So we want to look a little bit at power and weakness in names. A name is a word. It's not a word like other words. It is a specialized word. And in an evolution where generalism and adaption to many different conditions is the way of the evolution specialization is usually weakening. Now, a name sometimes points to a specific place or a specific state of being or a specific individual. Now, each of us is a specific being, a self, a divine focus that is unique from every other being. Even though there is great similarity and there is, uh, you're analogous to every other being, including God, uh, each one is still unique. Now, obviously, our birth name is not our real name because other people have the same name. And that's not <laughs> uniqueness. There are other people with the name Richard Kepsel. I even know one of them. And in fact, we used to work in the same building. Did you know him? In, in the old pharmacy building, he used to work there. He was a, uh, a biochemist studying water and the effects of water. Now, this was back in the late 60s and early 70s. I think he now lives in Ohio. 
And uh, the late 60s and early 70s, there were all of those flower people and all the kinds of wild things going on. And a lot of people wanted astrological readings or they wanted help with having a bad LSD trip or they just wanted to rap about all kinds of weird things. And so I chose to not have my name listed in the phone book. However, the other Richard Kepsel did have his name in the phone book. So from time to time, I would uh, ask him if uh, I should list my name. And he said, no, 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 because we like those unusual calls, even the ones that come late at night. They're, they're sort of amusing to us. <laughs> he and his wife sort of like them. And then his marriage foundered, and those odd phone calls became a bone of contention. And one day he came to me and said, uh, please list your phone number. So we can see that the name Richard Capsule is not unique. And that's not, you know, that's, that's, that's not uncommon. However, the confusion of individuals and names is not the kind of weakness we're thinking of. Our birth names are not much of an indication of character. People used to try to do that, but they weren't always that. If we read Cornelius Tacitus, he tells us that the Emperor Nero proclaimed himself a god. And when he did that, he had a grand celebration with thousands of people attending it. And he fashioned himself as something of an actor. And so in that, he acted out a marriage ceremony, including the wedding night, with himself as the bride. Uh, <laughs> Tacitus says uh, he was a filthy homosexual, <laughs> as if there were clean ones to him. Uh, but the name of the husband of Nero in this little drama was, of all things, Pythagoras. So what's in a name? It's, you know, it's <laughs> pretty ironic. Now, to arrive at the strength or weakness of names, let's look at them relative to words, ordinary words. As we said, names are specialized words. However, in their specialization, names are usually less meaningful than other words unless they have the power behind them. We don't learn very much from a name like Fred or Florence, not as much as we do from a word like uh, fear or flashy or something like that. Words themselves are not meaning. They are the vehicles of meaning. And in this, we find that there is a trinity between meaning or definition on one hand and words or vehicles of meaning on another hand and names on the third. Not surprisingly, this trinity is analogous to the divine trinity of being. The meaning and the potency in the divinity or in the definition and in the definer is analogous to divine spirit, which is represented by the Father, the always invisible Father. The word, or the lagos, corresponds to the life spirit, which is represented by Christ, not Jesus, but Christ, who is referred to as the son, the son born without a mother, 
alone begotten. So, basically, there are all sorts of references to this in the Bible, especially in St. John's Gospel. One reference is, to know me is to know the Father, said by Christ. In something well written, the words vanish and you see through, just as one sees through the light of Christ to the power of the Father, and one enters to the experience behind the words for which the words are a vehicle. And so if something's well written or well spoken, it is like that. Another example from Christ is, I of myself can do nothing. There has to be the potency behind the words. Words alone cannot do it. We have the expression of he was saying something, but they were empty words. Or Hamlet, when someone asks him what he is reading, he says, words, 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 implying that words alone cannot give him what he wants or what he's looking for, which is how to satisfy an invisible father. I don't think that's intentional, but it works out nicely. So there is in this an inseparability between the divine spirit and the life spirit. They are a unity. They are together. And that's what's behind the creative potency. So in this correspondence, a name represents the human spirit, the self, the unique identity. In the Bible, it is called, I am that I am which is the ultimate statement of a being, not just a universal spirit, as it is with the divine or life spirit, but a being, a spiritual being. And in this, there's something of an irony that when something is individualized, that same ability to make it individual Makes, it man, makes the possibility of many individuals possible. So the, by the same stroke that one becomes a being, many others are capable of becoming a being. Said another way, there is only one selfness, which is in the altruistic unity of life spirit, why in which is why in altruistic friendship, uh, everyone, you know, you're, 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 we're all, we love all one the same. But within that altruism, there are many, many individual selves. It is if the name for God is a formula or a derivation of all of the gods in the making, which it in fact really is, because that's what the nature of uh, ideational thought is. Now the power of a name and the self or identity it represents lies in the fact that the realization of creation is made possible by it. It is only through an individual that the creation can be carried out. There is the intention of the divine spirit. The, in, the divine spirit intends to create. And there is the love and imagination of the life spirit. But they need fulfillment. And that means they have to be shared. It means they have to be carried out so that reality can be carried out to fulfillment. Said another way, the universal spirit needs God and gods 
to be expressed or to fulfill its creation or to share itself with other potential parts of itself. It's not much different from us. We can't love unless we have someone or, or some ones to love. Now the weakness of what is represented by a name lies in the separation of the individuality from the whole. Even though it's within the whole, there is a separation. We're speaking about realization. And again, it's one of those ironies. It's the ironic paradox that the real is proven by the potentiality of unreality. Unless our creations are carried out against every possible possibility of unreality, we don't know that they are real. Our dreams are only dreams. They're insipid and they're effete unless we can live them out. They may be modified by the unknown or what seems unreal, but they are also realized. Now, we're journeyman creators, and our ideas don't always work out, our creations. Individuals cannot fulfill their divinity without the possibility of the loss of salvation. It's a big one, very big thing. We have to have the freedom and know it that we can drop out if we really want to. And unless we know that, and unless we choose completely in freedom to seek salvation or redemption, we are not worthy of salvation or redemption. If we have a grand creation like an oratorio or something like that, it's not possible without a large course, chorus of voices. However, each individual in that grand harmony must be able to hold his or her own for the whole business to work out. So for us to be redeemed and to be fulfilled parts in the creation, it is completely up to us in our freedom. Now, if there are weak uh, vocalists and they sing off key for a few seconds, if the whole group is weak, they can spoil the entire production. But usually in an oratorio, especially a cosmic oratorio, the inverse is almost certain. A person may falter and go off tune or off key for a little bit but the harmony of the grand movement is such that with little effort they can be brought back in. That's what's one of the nice things about being in this all together. Creatures like plants and animals which have no individuality have no names. They don't have any choice. They don't have freedom. They can only act in harmony with what they are commanded to do by the group spirits or by instinct. We're vulnerable when we have names because if we focus on our individuality, it makes us weak. Egoism is more dangerous than the temptation that presents itself to us. Temptation is only something external to us to which we respond internally. Recently in the astrology classes, we have not been talking about astrology, we've been talking about sanity and insanity. And we have said that 
Egoism is the opposite of sanity. It blocks the flow from spirit to personality or from personality to spirit. Then, by this same token, humility is the opposite of insanity because in humility there is complete openness and there is no obstruction or there is no blocking of uh, the flow from without in or from within out. When we talk about people who do decide to reject themselves from creation or from the whole creative activity, we're talking about something really, really rare. But unless we're willing to put it all on the table, there are some things that are not capable of realization. In our blindness now in the material world, we have to make the leap of faith. We have to act as though there were a divinity, even if we don't know there is one. And that's the way it is for a lot of people. But we have to put it all on the table. And our whole lives have to be that. But of course, that doesn't mean we should live recklessly. But if you think about it, it may sound blasphemous to some, but it sounds exactly what, like what went through Christ in facing the temptations at the crucifixion and taking, taking on something that was completely foreign to his spiritual nature. He put it all on the table. And he could not have been the Redeemer and he could not have unified with us to make it possible for us to be redeemed unless he had done that. So it's an important thing. You can see why I had a hard time. We're far away from, <laughs> far, far away from uh, a cogent talk. Now, some of this is in the Pythagorean idea of vulnerability in names. And there's a lot more that we could talk about in that, but it would be even more off topic than we are now. So far, we have spoken only of names as beings, which are powerful names. It is said of Solomon, that he knew the names of divinities and nature spirits, and with that knowledge he could command them to do all his bidding. Now, when we're speaking of first heaven, we're speaking more of a place or of a state of being instead of a being. Now, it is said in the mysteries that the keys to the kingdom of heaven which were given to St. Peter, were musical keys. This is similar to what we have been saying, in that if one attunes oneself to a given state of being, it is as if that state of being, that spiritual world, is open to him or her. But unless we can bring ourselves to that pitch of consciousness, it will remain close to us. That's a specific use of a name of a place. But usually, in general, the names of places are much, much more simple. For example, if we go across the border to Upper Michigan, you go a few miles, we come to a place called Waters Meat. Pretty obvious what that name means. And just up the road here, we have Portage which was a place that the Indians and the early European explorers had to portage their canoes if they wanted to get to the Mississippi River. Obviously, then, if first heaven is the first heavenly state 
we meet in the postmortem, uh, it is named that as a description, like water's meat or like portage. Now, it's that heavenly state that I'd like to speak about for a few minutes because we need a change of attitude commensurate with the experience of something in order to advance our evolutionary attainment into it. As we grow up individually and collectively, we have to change. We're always needing new goals. We're always needing new ideals. Now, a lot of us would like to unfold full clairvoyance in whatever world we wanted to see into. But very few people realize how, the, how we have to change our attitudes and how we see things or how we are in character. That's a pretty extreme experience. Not many people have that kind of clairvoyance. You can't expect to have an extreme experience and remain the same. You have to change in order to have the experience, and the experience changes you. It requires a change in thinking to be able to understand what you're experiencing and how it can be used or what its purpose is. Now, the word heaven connotes a place or state of bliss, not some illusory emotional bliss of the type that you get out of a liquor bottle or a pill or something like that. It's a place where one feels happy or joyous, seemingly without responsibility or care. In Orthodox Christianity and other religions, heaven is an incentive, a place where one strives to go or to get to, just as hell is an exceedingly unpleasant state to avoid. It's used as a disincentive to control our behavior, which is necessary until we can uh, recognize behavior in itself, for itself, by itself. We have to be led into what is right or wrong. Hopefully nobody in this room is in that place, but there are people like that. Now, it was necessary for some, and for much of humanity, it still is necessary. However, for us as aspirants of mystery schools, we need to look at the concept or the state or the place of heaven in a different way. First, there is the notion of reward or the earning of bliss. Truly, through the principle of action, we deserve all the consequences that our deeds or omission of deeds is, brings us to. That's a just creation that we live in. However, there are things which are good or ethical for our sake if we do them with that intention in mind, like I'm going to store up a good karma for my future life. You don't even have to think of one life way of looking at things. Uh, that tarnishes the gold of the experience. It puts a pail of... Uh, selfishness on it, so the gold gets turned a little bit to lead, which is the opposite of alchemy. It's like playing destiny. It's like playing for our own pleasure. And that doesn't strike me as a really benign or benignant way of looking at heaven, especially if we're aspiring Christian altruists. I have found for myself that if I reward myself, 
I have always impeded my spiritual growth. And the funny thing is the rewards that I would reward myself are far worse to for me than the good deeds that I did that were worthy of what I thought was rewarding myself. Now, a few minutes ago we said there are people who still need the kind of out outlook of reward. But for us, the time is now for something new. Now, it has helped us to come out of a grossly dark state of matter and a very primitive state of being, this kind of thinking of reward and punishment, but it's not enough for us now. In spiritual evolution, experience almost always precedes insight. We had to experience the state of form or to hold the form and sustain it in a mineral-like state before we could develop the will that became divine spirit. To some extent, talent and experience usually come pretty close to each other, but almost always experience leads talent. In a similar way, the experience of good deeds for reward can awaken insight that the goodness is its own reward. If we set out to do something good and in the process, in the experience, we realize, wow, that's better than what I, what, what I was thinking of. So the joy of doing good transcends the doer and any reward that he or she may have. And we can do a very great service to those we love and to those with whom we interact if we can help them to see this and take note of the joy that there is in helping others. There have been a lot of people that have been on really down paths, criminal paths and things like that. And when they start to realize what it's like to do good, it, it, that is a very great incentive to them. They don't need any external reward. This is the kind of thing like sharing a walk in nature or sharing the beauty of a piece of music or something like that. It's impersonal and it's pure. So by all reports, what are called the heaven worlds are blissful states of being. And though we deserve them and our stay in them, they are not vacations. And they are not meant to be places of entertainment. We can enjoy them, but their purpose is not a place of entertainment. It's not a matter that for we're going to be in a heaven for an eternity that is there not for nothing but entertainment or for vacation. That would be ultimately boring. Can you think that? <laughs> that's not a, very, not a very pleasant way of living at all. This requires a change in consciousness. Many people in the postmortem have difficulty even with the fact that they're perpetually awake. Even if the awakeness isn't very strong. There is no escape into the peacefulness of sleep. Sometimes our consciousness here is so edgy because of the way that we have brought ourselves to approach the world that we have little or no peace. Thus, when we would have a perpetual waking state of consciousness that was that edgy, it would 
be a horrendous situation. We need to change our way of looking at things, our way of uh, dealing with things in, when we learn new states of being or if we expand our consciousness. We all want to participate in life in one way or another. So heaven, to be heavenly as a vacation is not enough. Now this raises a question which, to which mysticism have an, has an answer, but most of the world does not like that answer at all. The question is, what is our true nature? Now, it's a question that's been debated for centuries, if not millennia. Many books have been written and many sermons have been preached about it. Some so-called believers will not concede that our true nature is spiritual, even though the scriptures of most religions uh, say so. They don't know what they believe. Right now we're discussing morality and ethics in first heaven, so we'll limit our discussion of this huge uh, topic quite a bit. And let's change the question is, are humans basically good or evil? In Orthodox Christianity, there is a belief that we have one life here on earth. And this is despite the fact that St. Gospels, St. Matthew's Gospel says something other than that. The spiritual leaders, the real spiritual leaders who are not necessarily the church fathers, brought this belief into Christianity intentionally, even though they knew about reincarnation. They urged this one life belief so that people would seek salvation with greater urgency and so that they would conquer the world, which is part of our evolutionary work. We're to take the mineral kingdom and bring it all the way to a state of divinity. It was found that in the, among the people who believed in reincarnation, there was a lackadaisical attitude, well, I can always do it in my next life. So it was instituted that there be a belief in one life. It's been successful because uh, uh, if we look at the world, in all the parts of the world, if we look over history, where there is this belief in one life, the world has been conquered. And it's happening now in places in the world where people are abandoning uh, the concept of rebirth and reincarnation and they're conquering the world also. Whether the urgency of seeking salvation in one life has been as successful, it's not obvious. I can't say that. I can't tell that from history. Material gratification and materialism has developed so strongly that reincarnation, that great truth, has been brought back into our belief for those who are ready. Now there are many issues in this which are worthy of a lot more elucidation, if there were but time. Uh, there are plenty of interesting things like that to go into. We're interested in one issue that is pertinent to our topic for this evening. It is about the origins of each of us. Now, if this doctrine of one life only was true, it would mean that at each birth a new soul was created. A soul with no history, no evolution, 
And that's a pretty strange notion, especially when we look around and we see people who are born into poverty, into stupidity, and with seemingly no talent. Well, at the other hand, we have somebody like John Kennedy, who was born to great wealth and was very intelligent and uh, had all these wonderful things. If the one life theory were, were true, that would mean things are very unjust. You might even get the idea that God, in making so many souls, especially at the rate that people are being born, that there wasn't enough time to have an equal or an even quality of souls being built along the way. However, that's not what we're looking for either. According to this view, again in Christianity, all humans are the descendants of Adam and Eve. And that view has problems of its own that we're also not going to go into. We're only interested in it with regard to our moral character of being. According to our belief, we are descendants from Adam and Eve who, when they started our descent, did so in sin, in divine disobedience to the use of the creative force. In Catholicism and in fundamentalism and a few other forms of Christianity, it is called the doctrine of original sin. This means that we are fundamentally flawed morally. It means that we have a predisposition to sin. If our character is not totally evil, it is at least partially so, right from the very beginning. Robert Penn Warren, in his great novel, All the King's Men, says it in a way <laughs> that is so clear, though a bit profane. Man is conceived in sin and born in corruption, and he passeth from the stink of the ditty to the stench of the shroud. Whoa, <laughs> that's powerful. But it is a pretty good statement of the doctrine of original sin. Now, supplementing this doctrine is also a doctrine of salvation, which is also not very pretty. And it has a host of problems, but they are, again, off topic. There's only one thing in all of this that is germane and relevant to our thesis about first heaven. It is the belief that from their very origin, humans are morally flawed and prone to sin. This doctrine is false. It is true that after many rebirths, we have acquired a very bad habit of selfish indulgence in sin, but we are not basically flawed and evil human beings. We were pure spiritual beings before we fell into this trajectory of sin and materialism, and we will be virtuous, but not innocent, spiritual beings after we come out of this journey through darkness. And it is so because we are basically good. The sooner that we realize and act on the fact that our core being is good, the sooner we will come out of this darkness. If we see the goodness in ourselves and others, and if we give ourselves a chance and others a chance to do good, we give ourselves and them the best chance for redemption. Of course, in this, 
we have to exercise good judgment because some do have a very bad habit of evil and taking advantage of people. And some of them are more astute in some ways than we are. But even at the core, those beings are basically good despite their despicable nature now. So it is our duty to foster that core goodness whenever we can. And we can do a very good service to the world if we remove this blot of misbelief in the human psyche from the outlook of humanity. We can do that by strengthening the fact that we are basically good and that all are worthy of redemption. I don't have to send them to the electric chair. Sometimes just a word or two in a casual conversation is sufficient to help this whole process along. We know that focusing on a flaw can set someone off or can put someone down, but by that same token, focusing on something decent, something good, something positive can also raise them. And when they have that experience of that comes through doing good, that's part of it. That's what they can experience, even if it's something very little. A lot of little things like that over a long time make a great change. So, first heaven is not something we earn. It is part of our ongoing being, and everyone will go there. First heaven is not idle bliss. It is a state where people live and act out of goodness. In first heaven is where we experience our true moral being and we live by it. And that's all we have. Any questions? Hmm. How many heavens are there? What? How many heavens are there? We talked about that last time, seven. Oh, yeah, that's... <laughs> There's a song about that or something. Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty common thing. It's a folk, uh, folk knowledge thing. The seventh heaven being in rosy terms the world of God. The sixth being virgin spirit and the fifth uh, divine, fourth life, third uh, ideational thought. Good, thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you